get this. There we go. And once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Los Angeles Birders webinar for February 21st. Oh, good. I got the month right. Uh, we are excited to have you with us, especially if you're a member of Los Angeles Birders. It's only $20 a year, and we appreciate your support. It helps us uh, afford and pay for everything from our mailbox to our zoom uh, to our zoom account to things like that we really appreciate it. we have no uh paid paid people within a lab all of it is on a volunteer basis so thank you very much and with that i would like to introduce desi seaberth who will introduce our speaker for tonight desi thanks ron Peter Pyle is a staff biologist at the Institute for Bird Populations. Peter attended Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, during which time he also worked on forest bird surveys in the Southern Pacific. He then became a biologist on the Farallon Islands, and worked for 15 years. Since 1996, he has been affiliated with the Institute for Bird Populations, where he conducts research on molt, writes research papers, and holds banding workshops. Peter is also a research associate at the California Academy of Sciences and the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, and has authored or co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed papers, four books, and a monograph on the birds of Hawaii. In 2011, he had the good fortune of, of describing a new species, the Brian Shearwater, which he named after his grandfather. Peter's perhaps best known for his two-point identification guide to North American birds, which has detailed criteria for identifying, aging, and sexing passerines and near passerines in the hand. Tonight, Peter will walk us through the important changes presented in the new second edition of the Identification Guide to North American Birds, including revised and consistent molt and plumage terminology, WRP, WRP, age and plumage codes that reflect this revised terminology, and much more. While Peter's guide is especially essential for bird banders, this new information is also of, of interest to both ornithologists and birders. So please welcome Peter Pyle. Thank you, Desi. Um, that was great, nice and short. Um, okay, uh, welcome everybody and thanks for attending. I hope, um, my screen share is good and let me make sure I can. Yeah, the screen looks fine. Okay, good. And I can also go between slides, which is useful. <laughs> um, so uh, I, uh, I thank you guys for inviting me to, to talk about this uh, revised edition. It just got, it just came out at the sort of the last couple days of 2022 and uh, have been uh, selling a lot so far and uh, a lot of back and forth and some feedback already and uh, I got to put a, a new errata up. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, it's been a, a, a fun long process, these identification guides. And um, I thought rather than just go through all the dry updates uh, to this kind of dry piece of work to begin with, um, thought I'd sort of make it a little more fun and uh, relate a little bit about how I got here um, with this series. And then also um, I put in a section on molt. I really want to talk a lot about our advancements in molt and molt terminology. So it won't just be what's updated in this guide, but I'll also include a lot of that. So I always like to put an abstract in here in case anyone wants to look at this later and pause it. But we won't dwell on that. Um, so where it all began, uh, I had the fortune of having sort of scientifically minded parents. Um, and my father was a meteorologist, but also a backyard bird bander back in the 1960s. Um, that's a picture on the left of my mom holding a solid owl in our backyard in, at the time, Washington, D.C. And that's my actually my brother who was two years younger than I am and um, and but I was nearby <laughs> somewhere I'm sure looking at the owl um, and on the right 
is also not me, but a photo of David Sibley, in fact, taking a bird out of a net at about age five. Um, and again, I looked all over for photos of myself, old photos uh, of me doing this, but I couldn't find any, but I assure you this is what I was doing at this age as well. Um, in high school, uh, I did a lot of banding with a group of Maryland bird banders, including um, Kathy Klimkowitz of the, bird, of the Bird Banding Laboratory and Danny Beistrack. And um, this led to the Audubon Natural Society of Woodend, Maryland, uh, asking me to set up a banding station on their property to, um, to see what birds were on the property because they were working on a, a checklist at the time. And I was only 14 and I wasn't allowed to have even a sub banding permit, but because my dad was in with uh, the bird banding lab and Kathy, he was able to get me a sub permit so I could run a, basically a migration, well, a year round banding station consisting of about 10 nets. So I did that. I, I skipped a lot of high school. High school was, was not a fun time there, but so I skipped a lot of classes and went and to the banding station to ban birds instead. And so that was where I got my primary education, so to speak. <laughs> um, after uh, college, I uh, was kind of traveling around, but got invited to, to become the bird bander uh, during this winter of 1980 at the Point Reyes Bird Observatory, what was then known as that now known as Point Blue Conservation Science by Dave DeSanti. And some of you probably know Dave, and unfortunately that he passed away this October chasing the willow warbler up here in the Marin Headlands. Um, but he got me started uh, thinking about uh, molt and plumages in the birds of California. Um, and his interest, you know, which is, led to the MAPS bird banding program uh, was that, um, you know, that the ability to age and sex birds in the hand was integral to being able to actually use banding data to, um, to, uh, to further the conservation of the species. A lot of bird banders back then were simply just kind of banding birds in their backyard without any real purpose. But by establishing the MAPS uh, program, we, he was able to get bird banders going um, in a direction in which we're able to collect data to understand the causes of population decline. And integral to that is being able to age the birds, um, age and sex the birds uh, in the hand. So back then, uh, this was 1980, the only real publication on aging and sexing birds was uh, Merrill Woods Guide. Um, from 1969. And, you know, he was, uh, I think he was a bander who lived in Pennsylvania. So the, the birds in this guide are all East Coast and there was nothing equivalent for birds on in California or the West Coast. So Dave asked me, hey, do you wanna put together some sheets on aging and sexing the birds we catch at the Point Reyes Bird Observatory, Palmer and Station? I went, yeah. Um, and, Word processing had just begun then, so I got in early on the idea that you could, um, you know, actually edit text on screen <laughs> and then copy one species to the next um, to to update that to what was known at the time. And uh, so I just had a great time putting together these sheets for aging and sexing the birds at um, Palomarin. Unfortunately, I don't have any copies of that or even computer copies left of that. Maybe they're somewhere. I'd like to kind of look at them again sometime. Um, in 1980, we had a visiting Swedish intern volunteer, Per Andell, and it was part of a, a program that PRBO had at the time to exchange, kind of like a student exchange where he came to, uh, PRBO to band and learn about what we do for a, a season. And then in return, someone from PRBO was invited to go to, to Faustabu bird banding station at the southern tip of Sweden um, to learn about their programs. And of course, I jumped on that as 
quickly as I could. And while I was there, um, I met and hung out and birded with Lars Svensson, who's there down at the lower left, uh, who had written the bird uh, guide identification guide to European passerines. And we took a long, nice birding trip one day to look for white-tailed um, white eagles and never saw the eagle. But during the process, he convinced me, hey, you know, someone needs to do what I, I did for North America. So when I returned to California that, that spring, I uh, started in on the identification to North American passerines, the equivalent to Lars's book. Um, and as co-authors in that early stage, and uh, Steve Howell, uh, someone, some of you might recognize these two characters in the middle, Dave DeSanti, also a character, and um, Robert Unick were the, the, the uh, co-authors on this first attempt. And, and Bob Unick was the one who was publishing the most back East on aging and sexing birds and was kind of one of the lead banders back then. Um, so that led to uh, the, um, the uh, let me move this thing out of me, uh, this first edition on the left in 1987. Um, and uh, then 10 years later, um, I wanted to update that, enough information had come along to update that. So uh, that led to the revised edition in 1997 uh, on the right. And in that edition, I was able to, um, to expand it to include a lot more on molt-related molt aging. The first edition kind of was more on just plumage, and we hadn't really gotten a full handle on molt limits and things like that for aging. So the second edition was an expansion of that, plus I added subspecies and near passerines, what we called it at the time, near passerines. I call them not... Uh, non-passerine land birds, probably a better term, which includes doves, cuckoos, owls, woodpeckers, hummingbirds, and so on, land birds that are uh, caught by banders frequently, uh, but aren't necessarily passerines. So I found this image online of the two guides. Svensson updated his in 1992, and this, this is his updated version in mine, which banders were using back at the time. So, Oh, I just mentioned all of this, added uh, 90 non-passerine land birds, treated all subspecies, that was another big uh, addition, and incorporated molt limits and new aging and sexing criteria in the updated version. So what have we learned in the 25 years since 1997, um, which is the cause for this revision? And it turns out we've learned a lot, but more than I thought. Um, when I started the revision and about 2019, you know, I didn't think it was going to take three years plus a pandemic of not doing anything else um, <laughs> to get it done. But um, but there was a lot more to incorporate into the updated edition than I thought. So I'll be going through some of these updates with you during this um, this lecture. But before I do that, I wanted to just update everybody on on Molt. Um, what where we are at with understanding bird molt and aging, um, and um, how how I think we've come an awful long way even since 1997 on on this subject in birds, and um, I think a big leap uh, was this paper that we published in 2003, updating what uh, what we all use here the Humphrey and Parks. Um, uh, molten plumage terminology, which is basically pre-basic molts, pre-alternate molts, and now uh, pre-formative molts. And um, when Humphrey and Parks did their molt terminology, they, they, uh, they termed that first molt out of juvenile plumage, the first pre-basic molt, but that was, that was uh, led to a lot of confusion. Um, and I taught a lot of workshops before um, before that change in 2003, and I, it was just very hard to get students and participants to understand molt because of the first pre-basic molt wasn't correctly termed. But once we re-termed it the preformative molt, um, it's been a lot easier to teach molt and plumage terminology and to understand 
what Humphrey and Parks were trying to do in terms of uh, in terms of um, naming molts based on how they evolved in birds today, as opposed to just where they are in you know relative to breeding and things like that. Now I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit in a second. So the big update, one of the big updates between 1997 and the second edition is this this simple line in the to begin the molt sections. Earlier it said uh, the per, the pre basic molt in hatching years the first year birds was partial and in adults was complete. Now we've turned it to uh, preformative mold is partial and the pre-basic molds are complete. And one of the things I'm happy about is that in 2008, I did the part two of this series, which included all of the water birds, raptors and game birds. Um, and so I've now treated 731 species and, and over 2000 subspecies with the same standardized molt and plumage terminology. And I think that's that's really an important thing to understanding bird molts globally. So here's a little section um, I'm gonna give you on, um, on molts. And it's from a webinar I did for Cornell's Birds of the World um, a month or so ago. And I've got, a, that, that's one of the links that's in the chat um, right now. Um, and the pre-basic molt, basically to understand Humphrey and Park's terminology, you have to start with where it began in evolution, and that's with the reptiles. So the pre-basic molt, which is the complete molt that birds undergo after breeding, um, has evolved from reptiles. And it's not just a replacement of feathers. It's actually a, a process of restoration um, of the birds. And that's why it probably occurs after breeding when they're a little worn out. But it's been described as alterations of whole body protein me metabolisms. So feathers aren't just being replaced, but the epidermis is being replaced. Molting birds are flaking their skin off, just kind of like what reptiles used to do. Um, they're undergoing some restorative processes of muscles and bone tissue and so forth. So it's not just a replacement of feathers, it's a process. And this is kind of important for understanding the molt terminology because the pre-basic molt or this complete molt or near complete molt that birds undergo every year is what sort of sets the framework for Humphrey and Parks moving forward. So, you know, birds we know came from feathered dinosaurs. So a question I had you know, probably 15, 20 years ago was, well, how did the heck did dinosaurs molt? And, you know, I thought we'd probably never really know. Um, one thought is that the most primitive reptiles closest to, to dinosaurs that are alive today are the crocodiles. Um, and they molt by shedding off big hunks of skin all at once. So it could be that dinosaurs did that too. However, we are now just starting to learn a little bit more about how feathered dinosaurs uh, did molt, uh, because some of the the fossils that are turning up show the the what's now the primaries, and um, and we can see that they actually are replaced in the same order that 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 birds replace their primaries now. So this is further evidence that the pre-basic molt and replacement of primaries. Um, actually evolved from the same processes in in reptiles. Um, and then there's also some uh, some papers back and forth on on how Archaeopteryx bolted as well. By the way, um, and this, these are some of the links I put into the chat. Uh, I'll be showing some papers that I and others have written and and at the Institute for Bird Populations. And they're all available linked from this site here, which you can get to by the, um, by the, uh, the link in the chat. And then also uh, I mentioned I did a webinar for Cornell, which is at this link below, which is also in the chat. It's sort of a more expanded version of uh, this, this uh, section of the talk I'm giving tonight on, on malt terminology. So, the Humphrey and Parks um, system is, is basically a, a, a cycle-based strategy around the complete pre-basic molt. 
and it's found throughout all birds, all lineages of birds, all bird species basically have this complete molt that involves not just um, changing feathers, but a whole restoration of, of body tissues and so forth. Um, so this sets the framework in the adults or definitive molt cycle. That's here um, showing adults once per year undergoing this complete molt. And then for some species, they've, um, they've got what we're terming an inserted molt within the cycle. So the pre-basic molt cycle basically goes from the beginning of one pre-basic molt to the beginning of the next. But if there's a second replacement of feathers within that cycle that isn't part of the cycle, then we turn that in an uh, inserted molt and, it, and it's called uh, B.A. Humphrey and Parks, the pre-alternate molt. So a good example would be scarlet tanager, for instance, where the adult male, which is what we see more most of here in North America, is familiar scarlet, but then they molt out of this on the breeding grounds into a, a green plumage. This is also an adult male. And so this is the basic plumage, um, which gets where the body feathers get replaced at the same time as the wing feathers, the complete molt. And then down on the wintering grounds in South America, it replaces the body feathers again into the red, red um, feathers, but not the wing and tail feathers. It's just a partial molt. So this is what we call the pre-alternate molt. So one of the, the, um, one of the important results of the Howell et al. Uh, transition was that pre-basic molts are all complete molts. So actually what we're now terming the first pre-basic molt is also termed the pre-juvenile molt. And it's the molt of the first complete growth of feathers that occurs in the nest. And then of course, these juvenile feathers <laughs> that are grown are quite weak. And that's one of the needs for the preformative mold is to, to replace these weaker juvenile feathers with uh, stronger feathers, which enable it to, to get through the first year. So molts in this first cycle differ, as I've been saying, and <clears throat> most, uh, if not all birds, I think potentially all birds have a preformative molt in, during the first cycle out of the juvenile plumage. And in many species, this mold is needed to replace low quality juvenile feathers within a month or two of a 14 month cycle. So the first cycle is 14 months because they've got that extra two months between hatching in the nest and actually the beginning of when most adults start the pre-basic molt cycle. So it's, it's, it's about 14 months. So for that reason, for a couple of reasons, they need to have an extra inserted molt that's unique to the first cycle. Um, and that's what we now call the preformative mold. So it's out of juvenile plumage, that white crown sparrow on the left, into formative plumage, which is the, the uh, white crown on the right. Now notice the wing and tail of the juvenile are pretty strong looking, they're okay. Uh, the wing coverts are, are, are also weak. Uh, then those feathers, the body feathers and, and, wing, and secondary coverts get replaced, but the primary second secondaries and rectrices are retained during the preformative molt in most of our pastorings. And I threw this question in and during the Cornell talk, I took on questions beforehand and pasted them in. And this is kind of an eBird question when you're doing an eBird checklist, when do you call it a juvenile and when do you call it an immature? And, um, and my answer to that was as soon as this starts molting out of juvenile plumage, it's no longer a quote unquote juvenile. And so therefore should be called an immature, even if it's only begun a little bit of the molt toward the formative plumage. Okay, so here's, um, here's a, a sort of diagram of the uh, first cycle below the adult cycle, showing that the first prebasic mold is here, it's complete, it's in the nest. You've got a longer period of time before the next pre-basic molt. So you've got this uh, unique inserted molt, the pre-formative molt within the cycle. And then those species that have, most land birds anyway, and passerines that have a pre-alternate molt in the adult cycle also will have a pre-alternate molt within the first cycle as well. 
Okay, the performative mold is pretty variable. Um, even in closely related species such as Merlin and, and Kestrel, it's actually absent in quite a few Merlins, but present in most and only involves a, a few feathers of the back and breast. Whereas in, in Kestrel, it involves all of the feathers, body feathers. Um, so it's it's quite different from, from the molt in Merlin. And then you've got all kinds of stuff going on with gulls where the preformative molt can be suspended and protracted uh, throughout the first fall. And actually, <clears throat> In some species, overlap with a pre-alternate molt that begins uh, after that, and I'll touch on how we define those two molts in a bit. Um, in some species, the pre-formative molt can be incomplete, and if you look closely at this painted bunning wing, these inner primaries three here and these secondaries are juvenile and brown, and this is what we call an eccentric molt that started here with P four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then, um, and then got these outer primaries got replaced, but not the secondaries, not the primary coverts, except one here. Uh, but the greater coverts, the tertials, and these outer primaries were replaced. And these result in what we call molt limits that allows us to age the birds in spring as, as uh, yearlings or, or uh, second calendar year birds. Other birds like uh, starling, and, and it turns out a lot of tropical species land bird species um, and, and some smaller birds have like bush tit and, and wren tit, most wren tits have a complete preformative molt where all juvenile feathers are, are replaced in that first molt at age two to four year, months of age. So to kind of recap the Humphrey and Parks and uh, Howell uh, system, the pre-basic molt cycle appears to be basal to all birds first evolving in reptiles or their ancestors. Um, the preformative molt may also be ancestral as well, an extra ectesis event, which is molt in uh, reptiles, in young reptiles to accommodate rapid, rapid body growth. So my, our thinking now is that, you know, a, a young lizard or dinosaur hatches from the egg, and in that first year, its body undergoes uh, a pretty rapid growth, and it might have an extra shedding of skin during that period, which then later became the preformative mold in birds. Um, hard to know, um, but that's uh, kind of, as, as you'll see in a second, uh, helps us make some sense out of the evolution of molds in birds. So pre-alternate molds, by contrast, have evolved and disappeared many times along bird lineages, so should not be considered homologous. And that's one of the things Humphrey and Parks kind of were stressing was trying to understand homologous molts. But it turns out that the uh, prebasic molt, um, the prebasic molt is the one that should be considered homologous and the pre-alternate molts not. So that's led to some confusion. So here's kind of a recap of that. that did, uh, did the prebasic molt evolve from dinosaurs? Yes. Did the pre-alternate molt? No. Uh, preformative molt, we don't know, but I kind of think so. Um, so, so that's um, how we can understand how molt evolved along uh, all these bird lineage, lineages that I just showed. And um, in addition, uh, there's been we've had quite a few terminological improvements on how we define molts in birds. For instance, especially for birds that migrate to the wintering grounds south south of us in the tropics and undergo most of their molting there, we didn't really have a firm handle on how to separate, for example, uh, preformative molts that were suspended for migration from pre-alternate molts that then also occurred on the wintering grounds. And what I found is that if we take a sequence-based approach, um, that is looking at the order in which the feathers were placed, we can then define the molts based on that order because these feathers generally get replaced in a certain order. And summer tanager is a good bird to study for this because in the males, they start out um, yellow like females, but as they molt in the first year, their feathers uh, first become brighter yellow if they're replaced uh, in before migration. Um, and then they become red 
once they hit the wintering grounds. And then a pre-alternate molt also occurs, which, which is red as well. So if you take a sequence-based approach, for instance, uh, this bird replaced most of the feathers on the wintering grounds uh, or, on, or most of the coverts on the breeding grounds. I guess that's the light yellow. And then started replacing some uh, tertials on the wintering grounds, uh, S9 and S, S7, and continued on with S6 as part of the preformative molt. And then that overlapped with uh, pre-alternate molt of uh, more coverts and the S8 again. So that's one of the ways in which we can separate the two molts. And, and I argue that the sequence of feather replacement is a lot more fixed evolutionarily than the uh, timing, location, <clears throat> and even extensive molts, which are quite plastic even within species. So if we look at sequence as a defining factor for how we, we understand the molts, it makes a lot more sense. So um, now there's, of course, <laughs> a lot of, uh, you know, there's another big system out there that people still use in this country, but also primarily in Europe, uh, called the life cycle terminology. And here are the equivalent terms, post-juvenile molt, uh, post-breeding, pre-breeding, and first post-breeding molt. Now, the problem with this um, system is that it sort of keys the terminology on the breeding season. And it's very, uh, say, boreal-centric. It, it, it works reasonably well for passerines uh, that are resident, say, in the Northern Hemisphere and have pretty set breeding cycles and molting cycles as, as responding to the, you know, uh, climate changes, the seasonal changes that we see up here. But it, the system, the life cycle system quite falls apart once you get to the tropics or the Southern Hemisphere or even on birds that that breed in the northern hemisphere and then migrate to the to the southern hemisphere, for instance, shorebirds and and um, some of those species, uh, and it no longer works because these molts are are could be post breeding, could be pre breeding. In many tropical species, they begin the molt, interrupt it, suspend it for breeding, and then start it afterwards. So so there's a lot of reasons why. The life cycle terminology is not a good system to use globally. Plus, there's no way to understand the evolution of molts when you try to use it. So there's an ongoing debate on mostly between Europe and Africans versus uh, Americans and Australians on which terminology makes more sense. And um, so uh, Jenny and Winkler, the classic guide for aging birds in Europe, uses the life cycle and defends it quite vigorously. Um, I can, I've come back and defended Humphrey and Parks. And then just, just a, a month or so ago, Yosef Kiat published another thing in the IBIS, defending, um, defending life cycle again. And now I've got some breaking news. Um, we're going to respond to Kiat with the same authors that um, that uh, that authored Howl et al. 2003, and I'll be submitting this next week. And in it, we're going to have this diagram here that that hopefully will make Europeans and others better understand what Humphrey and Parks were getting at. <clears throat> These are four molt cycles defined by Howl et al., and we think that a, a cycle that involves a pre-basic molt and a pre-formative molt, but no pre-alternate molts is ancestral, and that's purple. And you can see that most birds follow that molting cycle. Now, a few birds seem to have lost the preformative molt. Vultures, a few kingfishers, some seabirds have lost the preformative molt, but we think that's because evolutionarily they lost that molt, not that it was ancestral to begin with. On the other hand, quite a few birds like um, ptarmigan, mallard over here, gulls, alces, shorebirds, even grebes, these quite ancestral ta uh, basal taxa have gained through evolution uh, pre-alternate molts. So those are the ones that are in green, which have pre-alternate molts <clears throat> during both the first and the adult cycles. 
uh, now yellow are species that have evolved a pre-alternate mold in the definitive or adult cycle, but don't have one in the first cycle. So that's kind of another interesting thing. And it's quite possible that these birds, including cormorants, pelicans, loons, and even a, a few hummingbirds have uh, evolved a pre-alternate molt in the adult cycle that never uh, did evolve in the uh, first cycle. And then once you get up to this upper part of the tree, these are all passerines. And you can see that they all either have the complex basic strategy, the purple, without a pre-alternate mold, but that the pre-alternate mold has evolved several times amongst several lineages of birds, you know, from fairy wrens to our kingbirds, to shrikes, to uh, buntings, finches, vireos, but all of these pre-alternate mold strategies have evolved independently of each other from what we consider the ancestral strategy, which lacked the pre-alternate molds. So I, hopefully this response will allow some of those Europeans and others to kind of see what Humphrey and Parks is getting at, because it's quite difficult once you've learned the life cycle terminology to kind of switch your brain and, and see it in this manner. Okay, so under Humphrey and Parks, um, molts result in plumages. So the Prejuvenile molt or first prebasic molt results in juvenile plumage. We kept the term juvenile in our talking papers about molt uh, because it's familiar and well defined in all systems. It's can, we consider it synonymous with the uh, first pre first um, prebasic molt <clears throat> complete, as I mentioned. And then uh, pre-basic molts uh, result in basic plumages, um, pre-formative molts in formative plumages, and pre-alternate molts result in alternate plumages. So, so it's just so the take-home message here is that the Humphrey Park system is based on the evolution of molts, not on plumage. And plumage coloration, as you know, can be very plastic. For instance, species like uh, mallard and Mexican duck are, you know, really closely related, and yet the males have completely different um, plumage colorations. So that can come and go, plumage color can come and go rather quickly, uh, but uh, the molts themselves are what seem to be uh, founded more in, in the evolution of birds. Some birds change their plumage appearance without a molt. Um, for instance, snow buntings, starlings uh, have no molt, and yet because of the wearing of either the brown feather fringes on a snow bunting or the or the white tips of the of the uh, basic plumage of starling, uh, they look quite different in the spring. But they still should be considered in basic plumage because there was no pre-alternate molt. Okay, so based on Humphrey and Parks, uh, we developed an age coding system that we think is more uh, comprehensive and informative and useful on a global basis than the life than the calendar-based system that's widely used by banders. So banders widely use hatching year if the bird hatched that year, but then in on January first, uh, it becomes they all become SY second years. Uh, which is the calendar year based system and so on. And that works, that system work, works pretty well, it, again, in the Northern hemisphere in boreal regions, but completely falls apart once you get to the tropics. So turns out if you base the age coding system on molts and plumages instead of um, calendar year or relative to breeding, um, you can really compare age age coding and ages of birds on a global basis. So we've gradually been pushing this. The banding lab will now accept WRP codes. And slowly but surely, I think we're going to be able to evolve to a WRP system from a calendar-based system. So I'm not going to go into all the details of the system here, but we do have some webinars at our IVP um web page that you can you can watch um one of which is uh in spanish and well both spanish and english for those in the tropics um who are part of our mosey program 
uh, so you can really get, learn the details of the WRP age coding system through these webinars. Okay, so what else is updated about the second edition here? Uh, well, as I already mentioned, substantial addition of research on molts and plumages. And I wanted to highlight um, the value of the Macaulay Library now for understanding molts and plumages. Um, I gave this talk for uh, WFO, uh, geez, a year and a half ago, um, and uh, on on how to use the Macaulay Library to determine molts. And as I was updating uh, this revision, I got to the hummingbirds. Now we know pretty, we, we've got a pretty good handle on the molts of um, migratory northern hummingbirds for the most part. Um, and I'll mention a paper that Desi and I did on rufous hummingbirds in a bit. But um, for those eight species that breed primarily in Arizona and, and in some cases, Texas, uh, the uh, we we the molts the information on molts and, and plumages and aging was was all over the place um, and here are the eight species I chose to look at which which did not have good information um, three years ago uh, Rivoli's Lucifer violet crown broad build uh, blue blue throated mountain gem white eared uh, bear line and and buff bellied hummingbirds. Um, so, for example, these three guides on um, hummingbirds gave completely different information on the PB, the pre basic and preformative molts, when they occur, whether or not they were complete or not, uh, and the timing of them. <clears throat> All three noted that the preformative molts and, uh, were complete and the pre basic molts were protracted and variable. So what I did is I went to the Macaulay Library and filtered by month and location. <coughs> it's a filter for the United States. Um, so I was able to actually look at molts and plumages on birds um, that, that, we use, that occur here in North America. And just started sifting through uh, thousands of images. And for that paper, and this was just, um, a year and a half ago, I looked at a total of 27,581 images of these eight species, which included every image that had been posted. Um, and it turned out to be 6,348 individual hummingbirds because I eliminated the ones with um, duplicates. And uh, sample range of individuals was 280 white ear to 224 13 broad bill. And just before this, uh, lecture, I just went back to Macaulay to see how many images there now are of broad building. There's 22,280 images now have been uploaded. So that's that's nearly, uh, you know, uh, increase of tenfold in the past three years of images um, that have been contributed to the library. And they have an, an incredibly good filtering system, I think, where you can filter for month of the year and age and order the images by either quality rating or uh, when they were posted or date. Um, and I use date because date of posting, because that allowed me to, to sift through the same images of the same birds really quickly and eliminate uh, duplicate individuals for this analysis. So one thing that was clear from this is that all eight species undergo the same molt sequence. Um, and there was no exception to that. And hummingbirds are odd because they, they molt from P1 out to P9, P8, to, uh, out to P8. But then P10 gets molted first before P9. So P9, the second feather, is the last to get molted. And that was the case for all of these eight species, all eight species that, that are migratory, and I'm gonna guess all 300 plus species of hummingbirds will undergo the same sequence because molt sequence is very fixed in birds. I also was able through Macaulay to figure out the secondary uh, order of secondary molt, which hadn't been known before, and it starts with S1. Uh, they, they only have six secondaries. So the innermost and outermost secondaries are replaced first. And the last feather replaced is invariably S4, the fourth secondary, uh, during this study. 
I won't go into detail here, but um, you know, I was able to look at the timing for the preformative, the second prebasic, and the uh, uh, definitive prebasic molts in these species, and nobody, nobody of the three authors had it close. Um, and also a take home message is that the, the molts are pretty seasonal. Um, it, you know, they're not really protracted and that they're, they're, the pre-basic molts are largely complete. They're, they didn't seem to often be suspended or incomplete. So rarely was the preformative, now the preformative molt varied quite a bit, but generally was not complete in most of the species, whereas before we had considered it to be complete in all the hummingbirds. A few individuals, 3%, would have incomplete molts where they started and arrested the molt. Um, and then uh, Desi and I were able to work on, on her molt and plumage terminology with the Rufus uh, hummingbird. And it turns out they do have a pre-alternate uh, molt and it turns out all six, all eight of our migratory species of hummingbirds have uh, limited pre-alternate molts um, you know, that generally occur during migration, during the fall migration. And then the Macaulay study I just did was able to really confirm that we got the molt terminology correct in, in, in uh, Rufus hummingbird. Through the process, I was also able to put together an age and sex primer for each species online. And I don't, I forgot to put this one into the chat, but it's available at that um, IBP website with all the other papers. So a take home from this, and this is important for you guys, is that the Macaulay Library is, is clearly becoming a significant resource to study molts and plumages. And not just molts and plumages, as you know, but ID and migration and distribution and everything else. However, um, when I did my hummingbird study, a lot of folks love to take these pictures and upload them of these perfect adult males, but rarely do they put photos up of trashed looking birds. It's, it's sort of like the same thing that the, the collectors in the old days uh, used to do, they'd all take vacation in August and do something else instead of collecting birds because they didn't want to have birds that looked like the bird on the right there um, in their collections. But which one of these um, images is more informative uh, regarding molt? Well, the one on the right is uh, by a long shot, the, the first year male. You can study the extent, sequence, whether or not primaries are molted or not, and a whole lot of other things. Whereas in these adult males, there's nothing really to look at. They've just got all uniformly basic feathers and bright plumages. 76.5% of the uh, broad-billed hummingbird up photos that were uploaded when I did this study were of adults and only 23.5% were of males um, or were of uh, young birds. So don't uh, hesitate if you see you know, if you're going out and taking photos of gulls and you see a really trashed looking gull or, you know, so forth, um, please take pictures of that and upload them. And another thing, if you see birds in active molt, upload those because eventually we'll be able to, to sort of find out more about where, where birds do in fact molt. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And another big problem was there's a sex bias in the, um, images that get uploaded with 79% being males and only 21% being females. Part of this is due to males kind of being more visible and sort of photographable just from a behavioral standpoint. But I think the main reason is because nobody wanted to take pictures of the females, they wanted the pictures of the bright males. So this is sort of dumb. Uh, we need to not ignore the females when we're, um, when we're taking photos and uploading them to eBird. As I just mentioned, we really don't know a lot about where many of our species molt. And this one of the reasons for this is because the collections don't have a lot of birds that are were collected in active molt, primarily because they look so terrible compared to birds just after the molt, which is when they, in the fall, which is when a lot of the collecting was done, as well as the spring. <clears throat> 
Um, so there's a phenomenon called uh, monsoonal molt migration, which we've learned a lot about. And I kind of put this in because all of these um, new, uh, all of this new knowledge we've gained on the locations in which birds molt have been incorporated into the revisions with the ID guide. Uh, so these birds, they breed up in area A. And as we know, it gets very dry and hot in July and August and the insect um, availability of insect resources drops. So instead of molting here, after breeding, they go down to this area of Arizona, Northwest Mexico, should have a B there, um, which is the monsoonal area starting in, in early July, usually monsoonal rains come in and create a flush. Down here in May and June, it's terribly hot and there aren't a, a whole lot of breeding birds, big breeding bird populations, but as soon as the rains start, the insect um, insect productivity increases a lot. So these birds come down here to molt, take advantage of that, of the lack of local birds and the increase in um, productivity, molt here and then go on to their wintering grounds down here. So really they've got a three-part migration every year from breeding to molting, molting to winter, and winter to breeding grounds. So this was only relatively recently uh, discovered or figured out in the 90s. And uh, now we've um, got at least 19 or 20 species that we know do this. But it turns out it's not just those uh, that we need to study, but all birds. Um, paper we did in 2018 shows, based on data from map stations, shows that most birds don't molt in their breeding territories. Uh, and you can sort of see why they, they they're there they breed they probably exhaust the resources and um and then uh feeding their young and all and as soon as the kids are out of the nest you know they're just like let me go somewhere it's the equivalent of us taking a vacation let's get away from the the home turf and go somewhere else to molt and we don't know where that is for most species and that's the problem uh it was thought you know if you look at the older literature it says um including my own the books in 87 and 97 it says the that they mold on the breeding grounds but that's not entirely accurate as even the birds that mold on the breeding grounds leave the breeding territories so we we don't know where they go a lot of times um we need to know that because uh we need to be able to conserve molting habitat as well as habitat for breeding and wintering which have gained a lot of attention and conservation circles, but since we don't know where the birds molt, um, we don't know what habitats uh, they we need to conserve for these migrant birds, primarily migrant birds, but even resident birds leave the territories to molt somewhere. Um, so this is really important. And another reason why when you see birds in molt, active molt, take some shots of them and upload them to eBird and Macaulay, because that'll, and then, you know, there's even that little under the photos, you can cook a little uh, filter that says molting, and that'll help us down the road as well. Um, you know, then they can automatically see places where birds are actually molting. So some other um, advances we've gotten are age, aging woodpeckers. It turns out you can go to the third cycle in them in, in some species like blackback woodpecker um, by looking at exact molting patterns of the primary cover. So third cycle is basically TY in fall and 4Y in spring. And I've got some more breaking news. I've just done a big analysis on molten sapsuckers. And it turns out you can, all of the 4Ys look like they're ageable, not just some of them, and that some of them can be aged in their fourth cycle, which is 4Y in fall and 5Y in spring. And that's by looking at um, precise replacement patterns of uh, primary coverts and secondaries in this case, and where there are juvenile feathers remaining. Uh, we've also advanced quite a bit in our understanding of molts and owls, which are pretty interesting because they begin the primary molt not at P1 and go out, uh, but somewhere in the middle of the track and go out and then and then both in and out, eventually P1 goes sometimes before P2. So there's this 
sort of interesting molting patterns that occur within both the primaries and secondaries of owls that, that we've advanced a lot on our understanding of since 1997. So I was surprised to find, you know, I just start digging into the literature, what's been published since 1997, was surprised to end up citing over 1,200, 1,295 additional scientific papers based, uh, that, that basically treated molt or plumage or subspecies in, in the birds that are treated in the guide. So those were all duly read and incorporated into the accounts. Plus, I got feedback from hundreds of users. This is just the first page of acknowledgments. There's, I think, three or four of them. Uh, banders, birders, people sending me photos, people send, asking me questions on malt, uh, which I'm happy to take, by the way, because I always learn something myself when I take a look at it. And now we've got Macaulay. Uh, to go to as a great resource to answer some of the questions I'm getting. Um, so, so there's a, um, you know, since over 25 years, I don't know how many there are, but, you know, several hundred uh, folks are acknowledged for contributing information. Um, some other notable changes I have added, I added uh, 21 species to this edition. Um, so, so that's, um, they're mostly uh, non-native birds, but they're ones that have become established in, in the, the, the country <clears throat> since 1997. And uh, the uh, European, um, uh, well, let's say European turtle dove, European collar dove, uh, was just getting established when I started the book in 97. And I almost added it, and then I thought, uh, maybe it'll go away, but it didn't. So now I've added it in, um, in this case. Also, a couple species that barely make it uh, across our southern border and maybe have had at least one breeding attempt um, uh, in the last 25 years, which was my criteria for uh, for inclusion. Um, I put the table uh, measurements into tables, um, which are easier, going to be easier to read and compare between species and subspecies than the old version, which is where I had just measurements listed under sex. Um, so this should help. This is the way that I did it for part two as well. So, so I think this this will is an improvement. And then not only that, but I added values for exposed Coleman, Tarsus, and also mass. Uh, by species and subspecies um, where available. So all of this is an update from the 97 edition. Steve uh, went ahead and did 15 more illustrations showing some plumage characters and a lot on molt patterns and clines that we've learned in the last 25 years. Um, you know, for instance, molt and cuckoos which is which is uh, we've learned exactly how that works now, and different different genera do different things, um, you know. And the criteria that we now use to separate yellow-bellied and western flycatchers is here. Plus, um, you know, we hadn't noticed before that the coverts on on uh, northern flickers, the juvenile coverts, had a completely different pattern than the formative coverts. So it makes it really a lot easier to identify molt limits in flickers than we had previously thought, and some other stuff. Um, the molt clines is something I've been working on a lot. Um, and you can really see this. The more I look at it, the more obvious it is that after a complete molt, even though the molt happens fairly quickly, say over a month or six week period, you can kind of see a cline toward more worn feathers replaced earlier to fresher feathers replaced later. And this seems even more evident in the secondaries because S6 not only is replaced later than S1, but also it's more protected than S1 as well. Um, so these are what I'm calling molt clines. Hatching year birds that undergo partial molts, all of these feathers are, are molted in the nest at the same time. So they're all of the same age and they all look the same. Whereas you get not only this subtle, uh, Cline and freshness and sort of uh, saturation as the molt goes, uh, but also between S1, the, the outermost secondary, and P1, 
you also get a jump there because um, uh, S1 secondary molt uh, begins about when primary molt hits uh, P6 or so. So here's a couple of examples with clay colored sparrow. You can see all these SY, all these feathers are basically the same age in the SY, whereas particularly amongst the secondaries, you see this cline and freshness from S1 here, here to S6 there, getting slowly better and darker, uh, reflecting the replacement sequence during the complete molt, and then allowing us to age this as an ASY um, in, in spring. So these bar charts were updated, almost all of them got updated, um, and uh, reflecting all of this new information. And also I made an effort to combine graphs and species more often. For instance, the pygmy owls and the woodpeckers here and the alder and willow, just to um, to try to reduce the size of the book. And, and I kind of was successful. It took out a lot of repeat information, but then I added all the species and some other stuff. And so the species accounts actually ended up being about the same length, but I did reduce the number of pages. I'll, I'll show you how I did that in a little bit. Another thing that um, I kind of got, I called it a rabbit hole along with the with the uh, hummingbird papers because I kind of got diverted and had to, you know, find stuff out is I decided to really take a hard look at subspecies designations for, for the birds in North America and ended up synonymizing a lot of subspecies. Well, I call them synonymizing. They're not, I'm just, I guess it's just an opinion. But in a lot of cases, it seemed like the subspecies were just not identifiable in, in the hand. You know, that was my criteria. If you had a bird in the hand, you didn't know where you were. Could you ID the subspecies? And in most cases, the answer was no, even though there were some very slight differences between populations, which uh, collectors of yore were able to see when they amassed thousands of specimens and, and put them all side by side. But it just, they're not really identifiable when you, um, when you, uh, when you just have a single bird in the hand. And there's a 75% rule that I tried to adhere to which is basically that you can identify 75% of them by plumage and size criteria. Another problem with subspecies is that many are clinal. So both plumage and size may vary from north to south or east to west, but there's just a, a gradual change in those, uh, in those um, you know, phenotypic characters, size, wing length, or, or, um, or plumage. And, and in doing this evaluation, I again looked at thousands of Macaulay images from different states and counties in California to see if if I thought that there was really differences that could be, uh, you know, at the same time of the month of the year, I would take uh, fresh plumage birds and the Macaulay library is complete enough where you can do this, say take bush tits in September and October or October and November when they're in fresh plumage and compare them in all these different states and counties um, and and you know just just decided that there was little little hope in identifying some of these um, subspecies so here's kind of a quick list of some of the uh, subspecies lists that I've reduced um, in the guide and I'm hoping to get to a, to kind of publish my methods on this um, in the coming year uh, and a table on on which ones I actually did. Um, did uh, subsume which subspecies. Uh, so that's enough of that. Um, the way I did reduce the length of the book was by putting the literature cited online. And I think this is a good idea. If you have the other edition, you'll know that those, that literature cited was some 40 pages. And with the addition of the 1,200 more references would have been more like 60 pages of, of literature cited in this little tiny type. And not only is that kind of cumbersome to, to look through, uh, but it's also not, not really accessible very easily. Whereas if you have a PDF of the literature cited, you can quickly search for the papers 
and um, copy out the citation if you'd like and things like that. So I thought it'd be a lot better to have the um, the PDFs of the literature cited sections. And I ended up putting part two on as well uh, online. So these are available now online. You can just download them onto your computer rather than there being in the book themselves. And I've also um, gonna put an errata online um, and I don't have anything yet, but I've got five or six things. So I've got to put it up soon here. Um, you know, things like uh, the band size was not right or, or I had a measurement error of some sort that will hinder a bander's ability to say one of them was like big nails and great cheek thrushes. I had the the greater than sign and the lesser than sign switched, <laughs> so that's not very good. So uh, so I'll 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 be posting that errata with some of those differences here fairly soon. So if you want to get this thing. Um, our primary suppliers are Beauty of Books and Avenet, and their link, links are there. They're easy to find online. And uh, we just now put up an ability to, to order them directly from Slate Creek Press, and that's that page to the right. And so if you'd like to, to get a copy of this thing, um, you can go there and, and uh, follow the instructions and and send in a payment via PayPal and um, it'll be on the way. So that's all. Um, and I do have time for questions. I'm happy to answer questions for as long as you have them. Thanks again for uh, for joining me on this. Yeah, Peter, that was excellent. Uh, we uh, are getting compliments already in, our, uh, in the chat and all that and questions are popping yeah. up. Thank you so much. Um, so I have. Um, let's start with some of the questions. Which uh, please put them in the in the Q and A. But I see that um, if you're a panelist, you can't do that. So we'll get to um, a few panelist questions in the chat. Um, so Naresh asks: Have there been studies of molt in juvenile reptiles? No. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah. But they're all. Uh, they're all done in, in reptiles in captivity. So we don't know if that's gonna reflect molt in reptiles mm. in the wild. And that's something we've learned the hard way with birds is that the problem is that when birds are in captivity, they're subject to different light regimes than they're found in the normal world. They're also fed <laughs> a lot of food. And, uh, they don't have to work for that. They also don't have to worry about predators. And this ends up affecting their molt strategies. I think especially the, the light regime stuff, it's really hard to emulate. And even, even captive birds in outside aviaries, because of some of those other factors, don't, don't molt like, like the birds in the wild do. So I think the pro same problem exists with the reptiles. Of course, uh, you know, studying molt in wild reptiles is hard because you'd have to follow them um, or ban them or you know, mark them some way. But I think we're getting there with the technology. So hopefully um, some of those herpetologists out there are thinking about ways in which to kind of try to define molts a little bit better in, in reptiles. Hmm. Very interesting. Interesting. Uh, let's see, I have a question from Lance. Um, among birds in Western North America, which species would pictures of birds and molt have the highest priority? Where are the largest gaps in our knowledge? <laughs> uh, <laughs> good one. Um, well, you know, you start with the birds that are in trouble already, the ones that you <clears throat> see on, um, you know, conservation sites that are, that are listed in various ways. Uh, so, you know, I, I think, off the top of my head, I would think some of the rarer things uh, like uh, Baird Sparrow and Least Turn and um, some of these things which uh, which are a little bit skulkier and you might not really know too much about where they molt uh, would be good to focus on. Uh, there are some interesting questions. Grasshopper Sparrow has a complete molt, um, preformative molt, but also may breed twice, you know, in the state, molt one place and then molt another. So, you know, photos of that 
I mean, breed one place, breed, breed in two different places and molt in a third. So, uh, so that would be an interesting one. Um, and, you know, generally the rarer species are less well known. And if you end up going to the tropics in Mexico and so forth, um, or, you know, anywhere in the world, a lot of molts on those species are completely unknown. However, one of my roles now is to revise the appearance sections of the birds of the world accounts. So um, they've got me doing all kinds of species from all around the world. In fact, I did Gurney's sugar bird today. Um, that's a species in Africa. Uh, and nothing was known about the molts of that. But by, I think there were something like 297 images and there was enough there to kind of look at molts and plumages and figure out that yes, indeed, they have a partial preformative molt and you can age them through the first year and so on. So um, I guess that's, I didn't really fully answer that question. I'd have <laughs> to think about it a little bit more, uh, but but there you go. Do the ones that are already are in trouble because basically we, we need more information on molt in every bird. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, Alvaro asks, um, the the cycles are based on complete pre-basic molts as the anchor, but it has always troubled me when you have these big birds that cannot molt everything in one year, so it's not complete, like pelicans, albatross, eagles. In these birds, they never really have a complete molt. Do you have to define the molt cycle based on an annual cycle at this point in time, or do you redefine the complete molt based on the order of feather replacement for these birds? Or is a cycle actually multiple years? Interested in how do you think about these large birds? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do think about that. We have thought about that actually. Um, so that process, first of all, the body feathers generally are, are, are molted annually. Um, and then what the problem is, is that they don't have enough time within their window of molt to molt all of their, um, particularly their primaries, because of the feather mass is so much greater. And so a lot of them have developed this system called staffle mouths, or a lot of those species that Al just mentioned, um, including pelicans and so forth, where they'll go through an incomplete molt next one year, and then it stops. It's what we call arrested. The next year it starts where it arrested the previous year, which is interesting how they how it knows to do that. We don't have any idea. Um, and then we'll also restart another series. So for instance, it might molt P1 to P6 in the first year. And then the next year it starts with P7 and P1 again and goes out. Um, and so we'll consider those two separate pre-basic molts. Um, there was an idea that that the second pre-basic molt lasts three years and overlaps with the third pre-basic molt, which starts in year two and so on. But but that uh, you know, in trying to to find molts that way, it just became too. Uh, it just didn't make any sense. Um, and it was better to define each one of those molts as a separate pre-basic molt, which can be incomplete or in some cases complete because that varies itself amongst different individuals of the species. So that's the answer to that question. Now we did publish in one case, a molt cycle of turkey vultures that we do think overlaps. And in that species, they start the second pre-basic molt um, actually in February or March. So early, uh, you know, earlier than a full year later than they, than they uh, were hatched. And then they get out slowly to P10 by, um, by October or November. Meanwhile, another wave starts at P1 in October and goes through to about P3 or four before they stop the molt. And we had a hard time figuring out how to define the molt of that, but ended up deciding that that was, in fact, the second pre-basic molt overlapping then the start of the third pre-basic molt. Uh, in in that second year, and the reason we were able to do that is that from then on, those molts were were complete each year. Every feather was replaced, but it was then replaced in the same sequence where it started at P4 and went out, and then P1, 2, and 3 went at the same time as P9 and 10. So so that's an interesting case. Um, there there are a lot of papers uh, written about that, but 
you know, the, the thing that sticks through all of this is the sequence, in fact. Um, and that is, seems, I think that's, again, the way, the best way to define the molts is uh, by the renewal of, a, of another sequence begins the next uh, pre-basic molt. And I hope I got all those questions answered. <laughs> mm -hmm. But next time we're on a pelagic trip or something, we'll go through it a little more. <laughs> Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Yvonne asks, uh, is there any alternative hypothesis to flight capacity to explain the order in which wing feather bolts occur? Um, a little bit. That Staffelmauser is, is one. Because um, what happens is you could replace all of the feathers in one quick molt. But the problem is you'd need, for those bigger birds, you need to molt three or four feathers at once. And so what happens then is you get a large gap in the middle of the primaries. And that really inhibits flight mm -hmm. a lot more than if you have two smaller gaps. For instance, P2 and P8 molting at the same time is, is keeps the integrity of the wing surface better than if P4, 5, and 6 were all dropped or growing at the same time. So, so that, is, that is one reason why um why uh they may uh, the birds that have incomplete molts have adopted that strategy as far as just the sequence from p1 to 10 it's just so prevalent in almost all birds that somehow i think it evolved <clears throat> in those feathered dinosaurs uh just kind of evolved that way to replace one feather at a time in fact to keep the wing integrity um, and then it just kind of kept through most bird uh, order. Now, there are orders where it varies, like parrots and falcons have different orders. Owls, as I mentioned, have different orders. But once, an, once that order has evolved to a different strategy, it seems to be the case for all birds along that lineage or in that family. Hmm. So it's a very fixed uh, sort of event. And I think probably, it, and in fact, that paper on uh, Microraptor to end the one on um, Archaeoptics demonstrated that the, the primaries molt sequentially in the same way most birds molt now. So it seems to be a very ancestral process and whether how it got started in terms of flight mechanics <laughs> is anyone's guess. But obviously, if you molt one feather at a time, it's going to be better than dropping them all at once. And I should say one more thing, and that is that some birds do drop all their primaries at once. And these are ones that either don't fly flightless birds or are birds that are able to dive, swim, avoid predation uh, without needing to fly. And so these include alcids, loons, greaves, all molt their primaries all at once, but they're able to dive and feed and go on normal without necessarily having to fly. And a waterfowl do this as well. Now, what they do is they all molt, all migrate to some location, some remote location, like a, a big giant marsh. Mallards used to do this to the giant marshes in the Central Valley, or, or the geese will go up into the tundra and pick a place where they all sit around and, and molt, and they all become flightless at once for two or three weeks, four weeks. Uh, but there's so many of them that even if there's an Arctic fox or something up there that's going to try to get them, they'll only get a small percentage of them. Mm -hmm. And plus there's safety in number, and plus they often will go out into big giant water bodies that are around. So they're able to avoid needing to fly during that process of molt as well. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Very cool. Um... Let's see, Lily asks, uh, could molt research help in lumping and splitting studies? I don't think so. Um, it Most of it seems pretty plastic. The one exception, again, is the sequence. So um, I did a paper when owls and parrots, or I'm sorry, owls or parrots and falcons were first learned to be really close and falcons not close to other hawks. That kind of was earth shattering. I think that was in 2008. Um, I had noticed that both falcons and parrots start the primary mold at P5 or four and, and molt in both directions. So I kind of did a study where I looked at 
that molt sequence in all parrots and falcons, and um, and they uh, all pretty much every every genus, every uh, family within those two orders have the same molt sequence. So I hypothesized that that sequence evolved before parrots and falcons split. Now there was one exception, and that was the kakapo or owl parrot of New Zealand, which is this funny parrot that is flightless and um, and ground dwelling. Uh, and it molts, it was the only species of all of them that molts uh, more normally like other birds. It turns out it's the most ancestral parrot as well. So there's some chance that um, Nestor, the Kia, which is the second most primitive parrot and Falcon split off from, from the Kakapo uh, I'm sorry, is it kakapo? Well, the owl parrot before um, before um, that molt strategy evolved, and then it evolved in parrots and falcons after that split, and that that or in that that then went on to split into parrots and falcons. And and it's it's a good strategy for them because they're long winged, they really pointed wings, they really rely on flight a lot. Both those. And so by starting at P4 and going out in both directions, again, you got those two gaps in the wing rather than a big gap. And they're all both all the parrots and falcons, for the most part, are able to molt all their feathers um, annually in that by having that sequence. So the sequence can be used to kind of look at evolution in, in molts and birds a little bit, but not timing or extent or location, because mm -hmm. all of that is, or even the strategy, whether or not they have a pre-ultimate molt will vary a lot uh, between spe species that are uh, very closely related. Hmm. But that sequence in, in, in parrots and falcons, um, presumably could that have been used to determine that parrots and falcons were closely related and yeah. not related to the other hawks before it was actually figured out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nobody, nobody did. Nobody, nobody did, that's that, interesting. <laughs> the problem was that the molten parrots wasn't really well known. Um, mm -hmm. And so that had to get figured out a little more. To, and then it was like, hey, it's a lot like falcons. Um, but by then they've done the molecular, and that of course is a, <laughs> mm -hmm. is a pretty good way to, figure that stuff out as well. Right, right. <laughs> great, great. Thank you. Um, another question from Yvonne. Um, are there any um, species hybridizations known that result in novel wing feather molt patterns? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, the, the species pair I like to cite a lot are golden plovers because Pacific and American golden plovers really molt it a lot differently. Um, Pacific has a incomplete preformative molt, and American has a complete preformative molt. And then the American migrates north uh, in sort of a basic plumage before molting into its breeding or alternate plumage, whereas Pacific stays on the wintering grounds before molting and does that. So, you know, you sort of see hybrids or or birds that you think might be hybrids, and they they do in fact have some weird molt pattern that's sort of a, a cross between the two species. Um, I think the problem, the bigger problem, is that you know we just nobody but hybrids are hard enough to find, um, uh, except in a few cases, and and when you do, no no you know rarely do you see them when they're actually in molt. Um, and so there's, we just don't know a lot about that. And then in cases where we do, for instance, Western and Glaucus Wingull, you could really study the molts in those easily, but those two tax a molt pretty much the same anyway. So there's not a lot to learn from looking at the molts of the hybrids of those. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um... Let's see, do we have, there's nothing else in the Q&A. Um, in the chat, um, Peter um, raised uh, the point that he used the Macaulay Library and eBird um, heavily for uh, for mold, um, mold understanding and all that. And so Al Jaramillo, 
posted that uh, he has a YouTube video that, and he posts the link in the chat you ought to grab, um, how to use that, how to use eBird um, photos. I'm not seeing it right, am I? How to use McCarthy yeah. Library. Yeah, how to use eBird photos. To help with, help with ID. ID. Help yeah. with ID. So that might be interesting. So please mm -hmm. grab that. I, I also um, see Al's comment there on the Roar paper on the Orioles. And yeah, there's a good example of, of a study that was done in the Maltz, Baltimore and Bullock's Orioles, which also differ uh, pretty much. It's another example of so that have evolved pretty different malt strategies. And and indeed, I think mm -hmm. I think you did find that the malt strategies of hybrids were kind of a mix, as you'd expect, I guess. Great, thank. Uh, sounds great. I don't see any more in the Q and A or on the chat. So, Peter, thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, yeah, your thank you so much. webinar tonight. I think everyone really enjoyed it. I hope. Yeah, I hope everyone can join us next Tuesday night for our next webinar, which will always be fascinating. And I think in the meantime, we'll see everyone out in the field. Have a good evening, everyone. And again, thank you very much, Peter. And thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. And we'll we'll see you all next time. Thanks, all right. thanks everybody. Thank, yep, you. thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thanks again. Great yep. job. Bye-bye now.